The U.S. Navy is exploring a sweeping redesign of its surface forces under a working concept informally labeled the Golden Fleet, a vision that, if pursued, would recast how America projects power at sea. Rather than centering combat power on a small number of exquisite platforms, planners are sketching a distributed architecture that blends very large, heavily armed surface combatants with smaller, agile ships and a thick layer of unmanned systems. The animating purpose is straightforward, outpace China's accelerating naval buildup while surviving in a battle space suffused with long-range sensors, precision weapons, and increasingly autonomous threats. Early conversations inside the Pentagon and Navy staff suggest the flagship of this approach would be a next-generation capital combatant noticeably larger than today's Arleigh Burke destroyers or the retiring Ticonderoga cruisers. Displacements discussed by officials reach into the mid-teens of thousands of tons and beyond, creating room for integrated electric propulsion, hardened power and cooling for advanced sensors, and deep magazines sized for long-range and hypersonic strike. Such a ship would function as a missile arsenal, air defense commander, and battle network node all at once, raising the volume and reach of U.S. salvos while improving the chances of staying in the fight after absorbing the first blow. Mass alone will not deliver the concept's intended resilience. A second pillar envisions light frigates and corvette-class vessels designed for speed of construction, modular payloads, and lower signatures. Deployed in numbers, these smaller hulls could spread across contested seas, complicate an adversary's targeting, and assume specialized roles, sensor pickets forward of the main force, decoy and deception carriers, or missile shooters leveraging containerized launchers. The intent is to saturate the kill web with many adequately capable platforms rather than rely on a few irreplaceable flagships. Unmanned surface and subsurface vehicles are assumed from the outset rather than treated as experimental curiosities. Lessons from the Navy's recent manned-unmanned trials point toward practical tasks, robotic picket lines that extend the sensor horizon without risking crews, autonomous magazine carriers that swell the fleet's firing capacity, and expendable scouts that pry open heavily surveilled choke points. For that to work in combat, the Navy will need robust autonomy, common control interfaces, and communications pathways that degrade gracefully under attack. In effect, a destroyer captain will have to orchestrate robotic teammates with the same confidence and tempo used today to task helicopters or UAV detachments. The strategic rationale is anchored in hard arithmetic. By hull count, China already fields the world's largest navy and is commissioning modern combatants at a pace that strains Western assumptions about industrial output. Beijing has paired those platforms with long-reach anti-ship ballistic missiles and maturing kill chain sensors that make traditional operating patterns around carrier strike groups far more hazardous. A U.S. surface force designed for the last era's threat, when early warning was scarce and time of flight was generous, will struggle if it cannot disperse shoot farther, and reconstitute. The Golden Fleet is a counterdesign, more launch cells across more holes, greater redundancy in sensing and communications, and a bias toward attritable systems that can be lost without unraveling the fight. Turning vision into steel will be the crucible. A super destroyer with advanced power, hardened infrastructure, and a giant radar budget is not a paper study, it requires industrial capacity that is already heavily tasked by ballistic missile submarine production and carrier sustainment. New or expanded dry docks, thousands of trained welders and electricians, and stable multi-year contracts for suppliers from gas turbines to phased arrays are all prerequisites. Integrating hypersonic weapons at scale is another pacing item. U.S. hypersonic programs are marching forward but remain cost-intensive, production-limited, and technically demanding. It is not enough to design a ship with room for future missiles, the missiles must arrive on time, at quantity, and with shipboard interfaces that crews can operate without turning every deployment into a test event. Cost will shape political gravity. Rough order estimates circulating among program watchers put a large surface combatant in the multi-billion dollar per hole range, with price swings driven by the radar, combat system, and weapons fit. Lawmakers will likely interrogate three questions before endorsing big checks, 
does the architecture deliver lethality per dollar that beats the status quo? Can it survive in a hypersonic saturated environment long enough to matter? And can American shipyards build it predictably rather than in fits and starts? Without persuasive answers, the Golden Fleet risks becoming a brand rather than a blueprint. One accelerant could be allied industrial capacity. European yards, experienced in turning out corvettes and light frigates at scale, may be invited into a co-production model for smaller Golden Fleet variants destined for US and NATO service. Interoperable combat systems, shared spares, and common training pipelines would spread cost and speed deliveries, much as the multinational fighter model did for air power. Meanwhile, the Navy's Constellation-class frigate program remains a bridge, offering a near-term uplift in numbers and a venue to mature sensors, launchers, and combat system software relevant to future flights of larger ships. Doctrine and logistics would evolve alongside whole forms. A distributed surface force implies new approaches to munition stockpiles, battle damage repair, and a float resupply under fire. It favors deception, frequent emissions control, decoy nets of unmanned craft, and dynamic basing supported by joint partners. It also pushes the fleet toward faster kill chains that compress fine fix finish timelines and tolerate intermittent connectivity. That, in turn, nudges the Navy to adopt more open combat system architectures, where software increments can be fielded on a drumbeat and where ships can accept new payloads without deep dock refits. Skeptics point to the risk of overreach, designing a ship a generation ahead of the industrial base while relying on weapons that are only a few years ahead of production maturity. There is also a risk of organizational fatigue, the Navy has seen ambitious surface combatant programs stumble on cost or complexity, and congressional patience is finite. Advocates counter that the operational environment is changing faster than the fleet and that incremental updates to legacy designs will not restore deterrence. Both are right in part, which is why early prototypes, spiral development, and transparent testing will matter more than slogans. A prototype power architecture proving integrated electric drive under realistic loads, a sea-tested large radar tied to resilient networks, and a credible pathway to weapon inventories at scale would do more to convince stakeholders than any glossy rendering. If the Golden Fleet progresses beyond concept notes, the timeline will likely feature staged gates, an initial requirements outline to frame trade spaces, seed money for risk reduction on power, sensors, and launchers and a deliberate downselect to a lead ship design accompanied by a parallel push on light combatants and unmanned cohorts. Expect the Navy to harden its case with operational trials in the Indo-Pacific, where manned-unmanned teams can rehearse distributed kill web tactics under the eyes, and jamming, of real adversaries. The measure of success will be empirical, tighter shot-to-hit timelines, credible battle damage tolerance, and production lots that arrive on schedule. What ultimately emerges may not carry the Golden Fleet label at all. Names fade, architectures persist. If the United States fields a surface force that can distribute, deceive, and deliver long-range fires at scale, while surviving to reload, the strategic effect will be unmistakable. Carriers will remain central, but they will operate alongside capital surface ships with cruiser-like displacement and magazine depth, escorted by nimble light combatants and shadowed by robotic pickets. For joint planners, that unlocks options across domains, for industry, it promises steadier demand and workforce investment, for allies, it offers a path to contribute mass quickly. The stakes are high, but so is the payoff, a fleet an adversary cannot confidently target, cannot swiftly paralyze, and cannot afford to challenge without risking more than it can gain.